Hi, everyone. My name is Mark Rankin. Um, I'm coming from Ocean Networks Canada up in Victoria, BC, Canada. Um, today, I'm going to be talking to you about an online uh, mapping tool we built um, for a marine protected area. Uh, this is a project for Fisheries and Oceans Canada, a branch of the Canadian government. Uh, so just a little background about Ocean Networks Canada. I'm just going to share our vision with you today. Um, our goal is to enhance life on Earth by providing knowledge and leadership that deliver solutions for science, society, and industry. Um, so Ocean Networks Canada started with an idea to put uh, an undersea cable off of Vancouver Island, and it was the world's largest undersea cable. It goes from Port Alberni, which is a small village in Vancouver Island, and it goes about 250 kilometers west into the ocean and then loops back around. And off of this cable, we have hundreds of different instruments, um, uh, anything from measuring um, temperature in the water to more advanced technology as in seismometers. So we're starting to predict earthquakes and give a warning message system out to uh, the, the province of BC. So for today's talk, just a little outline, I'll be talking about the Endeavour Hydrothermal Vents Marine Protected Area, a little bit of background about how it was discovered, um, what's located there, and then I'll dive into what kind of spatial data is available, and then how we took that spatial data and hosted it on our own servers to integrate it and put it onto an online map. And hopefully, if there's time, I can answer any questions that you may have. So first of all, the, just a little map of where the Endeavour Hydrothermal Vents Marine Protected Area is. It's a pretty small area just in the south of that image. So within Canada's EEZ, there's two MPAs. The Endeavour Hydrothermal Vents was first discovered in 1982, but officially became an MPA in 2003. And then more, more recently, we have the Bowie Seamount, which is uh, just recently discovered. So there's a lot of hype around that one. So within the Endeavour MPA, there were five known vent fields, and they have really interesting names because the scientists just come up with crazy names. So there's uh, Salty Dog, Sasquatch, Mothra, and Main Endeavor Field, and yeah, uh, another one I can't remember off the top of my head right now. But what's interesting about these vent fields is that they're basically unique areas where these hydrothermal vents just basically erupt from the seafloor. So picture yourself, kind of like on Mars, it's like super barren, and then out of nowhere come these 30 meter stacks up to 100 feet of these uh, basically like a spire like uh, image. And I'll show you one in just a second here. So this is what we're looking at. These huge vents come up and there's sometimes black smoke, clear smoke, um, various types of species. And it's fascinating because in this area, it's actually been documented that there's more biodiversity per square meter than there is on the Amazon. So this is why they're very unique ecosystems and why we're putting so much energy and effort into protecting them. So in, in just this area alone, you have 90% um, of the species are endemic to just this area. And there's uh, 12 species that will only exist in this area. You'll, you won't find them anywhere else on the planet. And what's fascinating about this is that this is 2.2 kilometers below the seafloor, so there's no sunlight penetrating this area, um, and it's extremely toxic. So the materials that are coming out of this smoke uh, can be anywhere from like zinc, sulfur, copper, iron, and this is what the, the, the species thrive off of. So they're purely subsisting off of this. And so what, what we'll see happening is that we've had scientists come to this area year and year again, and they've seen these spires collapse, and basically all these species will die off but then we'll see a new spire emerge maybe a few hundred meters away, and all these species will colonize within a matter of months. It's extremely fast how, how, how fast these species get around. So just getting into what spatial data we found. So we have data that goes back to the year 2000. So since its discovery, we've been able to contact previous explorers, previous navigators, and understand kind of what type of data they're getting. So a lot of the dives uh, had to be used with submersibles. So we had ROVs, remotely operated vehicles, AUVs, so like autonomous underwater vehicles, and human uh, um, operated vehicles. So like we'd have humans go down there and explore the area. And so what we were able to do is document exactly where these submersibles were going. And so because the navigation data is so precise, we can get exactly where they were going. And a lot of them even had footage on them. So high definition cameras, um, we're able to document the, the area. Uh, for our more, more recent dives, like within the last five years, our, our uh, underwater uh, videography was so good that BBC 
Pla uh, Blue Planet 2 contacted us to get some of our footage. So if you watch episode three, you'll see a lot of our footage from that. Um, so just going into this picture, this is uh, showing all the track lines of where these ROVs and submersibles have been located. So you can kind of see the hot spots of where uh, the popular areas are. And so like that big blob kind of in the middle, that's the main endeavor field. So that's where you'll see hundreds of these, those uh, vents I showed earlier with all these different types of species, uh, tube worms, anemones, you name it, there's so much stuff going on there. And so we were able to basically find all that, track it, and then put it into our, our geodatabase. This is um, another aspect of the project that we're working with, with Fisheries and Oceans Canada. So not only were they interested in seeing what type of human activity was going on, they want, also wanted to see if there was any uh, debris, so like any anthropogenic debris. And this is what this is showing. So we're classifying it into different categories. Uh, we see a lot of different fishing gear. So although this is a marine protected area, it means that no fishing is allowed to take place, especially uh, trawling equipment. So if you like, have those extreme weights that go on the bottom of the ocean floor, they can knock down these chimneys and basically obliterate any of the, the vents that have taken place. So we want to eliminate that. Um, we're seeing random pieces of garbage like tea kettles, pop cans, it's different types of plastic. And so we're all able to navigate the exact location of where we saw that. So we took all that data. So we, we basically found it from third parties. We have our own cruise data. So Ocean Networks Canada, because we have this massive cable infrastructure, we have to go down there and maintain it every few months. And when we do that, it's extremely expensive. It's about a dollar a second. We have to hire um, a huge uh, ROV crew. We usually get the Canadian Coast Guard and get one of their exploration ships. We, have, we send out our own, our, our own scientists and then we run our own cruises. But then we also have to do research with the third party to see what kind of data they got. So once all those conversations have taken place, we're able to take all that data and put it into our own um, database that we have at UVic, University of Victoria. And then from that geodatabase, we basically just pick and choose the spatial data that we're interested in. So you can see in that Esri file database, we have dive tracks, um, physical samples that we've taken, any visual surveys that we might take with a lot of high quality metadata. So what's great about um, the expeditions that take place is that we have a dedicated person or like a few people that 24 seven will log exactly what the ROV is seeing. So they'll be putting um, in exact species of corals or uh, may maybe classifying a substrate. And so what we do is we basically have like a, a log logging system where they track keywords and then we can search through those keywords to determine exactly where those things have been located. So corals, for example, we can see people might be logging a species of coral, then we can start to navigate, okay, this is where the exact like lat long coordinates of where those were. Once we all have all that data, we host it on our own server, um, and then we create an online map and we basically just link to those uh, server locations. And then we would share it with our Fisheries and Oceans Canada or wh whoever wants it. And all this data is free to, for, for you guys. You can Google Endeavor, MPA, Ocean Networks Canada. This map will show up and you can access all of this. So this is what our online map is looking like. So this is just our Ocean Networks website. I've cut out uh, quite a bit of it, but I just wanted to show you kind of how we embedded the online map into our system. So this is just showing those the vent fields that I was talking about earlier with a nice bathymetry layer. Um, and then let's just dive into this. So. With this online map, we can have tens of different layers. I just wanted to show you this one here, which is corals. And so what's great about this is that we enabled pop-ups, which I'm sure you're familiar with. You can see all the different attributes that we have there, um, the depth, lat long, and then also that comment. So that was like the logging system I was talking to you about earlier. But the most fascinating thing that I, like, I, I really like is this video link here. So Ocean Networks Canada is also, there's a huge team of software developers. We have, we have like 60 people who uh, are working on anything from developing new tools, uh, new website developments. Our, our biggest or like our, our proudest achievement is this system called Oceans 2.0. And basically that's an in-house software that we provide to monitor all these scientific instruments. And so this video link, I'm just gonna show you this right here. This will open up, if you, if you click that, it'll open up our Oceans 2.0 software. This is uh, just like an aspect of that called CTube. So CTube is basically, it's like the YouTube of the ocean ROV footage. And we have all, all the cruises on the left there. So that goes back to like around 2012, 2011. And uh, for each one of those cruises, there's each dive. So you can click onto a dive and then you have the timestamp of what, what was being logged at the time. So just going back 
so this look ma a coral art style is just like what the dive comment was you can see it's the exact point in time in which they saw this so that was really useful because even if you're if you're looking at an online map it is it's quite visual you can get a good idea of what's going on but actually seeing the footage and like hearing the navigators hearing the chief scientists talk about what's going on actually just like basically feels like you're right in the ocean looking at this it's so useful and when uh we demonstrated this with Fisheries and Oceans Canada. They were just blown away. They didn't even know this technology existed. They, they were so surprised. And we've, we get emails from them being, and they're saying that they're using this, this feature. So it was, it was really useful. We were really happy about that. Um, and yeah, that was, that was basically our project wrapped up and we were really happy about delivering it with them. So thank you so much for your time. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Anybody have some questions for for Mark? Come on. <laughs> there we go. We got a question over there. Hi. So your presentation was really cool, too. I have a background in marine protected areas, and one of the things that my organization is trying to do is, you know, create a way to map them effectively. Mm -hmm. Did you create the tool? Like, did your company create the tool that you use for, like, ma like monitoring this particular area? Um, we didn't create the tool, no, but we, in order to, like, integrate the data, we we are using a lot of our, our own footage, for example, but we also had to use third-party data. So a lot of that navigation data can be very um, cluttered. It's very confusing on how to use it. So we'd have a lot of back and forth between them figuring out, like, okay, well, what does this field mean? Because sometimes it's just a random code generated. So there's a lot of back and forth. But integrating it into the online map, that was super simple. It's just basically a line, uh, like polygons, lines, or points. And then once we have that, just push it online and yeah. Very cool. Forward. What online platform did you use? Did you use Google we we use stuff? Uh, sorry, ArcGIS online for this one. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any more questions for Mark? So Mark, I'm thinking about the presentation we saw earlier from Yuko, and mm -hmm. you know she had access to some video data with some navigation. Do you guys provide access to that type of information as well? To yeah, work? I mean, going back, uh, all of this is free. So this is public. You don't need to be logged in. You don't have a special access code. This is all free that you can get. Um, and there's thousands, maybe even millions of hours of ROV footage that you can use, download in high quality. Um, this is what we shared with BBC. So you can get the footage 1080p, super high quality. Mm -hmm. Nice, thank you. That's a great resource. Mm -hmm. Oh, we got some questions over here. I stirred up. You got a question? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Well, kind of question. Are you interested in uh, creating 3D model for this hydrothermal band? You can yeah. see it. You know, you can project it using real virtual reality. <laughs> yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, yeah. We've actually done that before. We were interested in creating a virtual reality product with this. But what we've been noticing, um, especially in the hydrothermal vent area, is that it's kind of difficult because the liquid that's coming out of the vent is 300 degrees Celsius, and it really distorts the type of imagery that you get because you're basically trying to shoot light through this warpy right. medium. So it's better for this type of environment, like the corals, the, like, the arches, but going into the vent system, that's, it's almost impossible. It, it, the, there's, like not, there's not a lot of equipment out there that can sustain, like last in that temperature. Really, I was interested in you know, mapping the hydrosomes mm -hmm. then, particularly. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. I see. Yeah. Here we go. Another question up here. Great presentation. Um, real quick question. So um, a lot of my work is in the pelagic open ocean environment for aquaculture. And we need to, one of the biggest things is trying to characterize these highly diverse, extremely biodiverse areas, such as these hydrothermal vent areas. How far do you think we've come along as far as characterizing those environments in a geospatial manner so that we can account for them when we're planning for these ocean spaces? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think we're still very like um, far back in the game. I think there's a lot to go for these types of areas. Not a lot of people, like there's so many, um, within the Ring of Fire, there's so many different areas where these vents could occur, but we don't really know exactly where they are. 
this one, we, I mean, this was only recently discovered around like 30, 40 years ago, but there's hundreds around that I've heard about. I mean, um, we work with uh, the Nautilus crew and they they go to like places around Hawaii and they discover these vent areas all over. I mean, no one even knew that they existed. So uh, there's definitely a lot more work to go. And I think this is a good place to start for putting these marine protected areas is because there is such an abundance of, of biodiversity and yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I got another question, unless mm -hmm. we got more out there. So there's, you showed two MPAs in the beginning, I guess in the EEZ off the west coast of Canada. Yeah. And the first one, it seemed like, took 11 years, right, to get accepted as an MPA. What about that second one? You the, the second one's more recent. I think that's within the last five years. And there's, uh, yeah, a lot more attention to that, especially because it's um, in an in indigenous uh, area. So the, the gov government of Canada is really pushing for that right now. So they put a lot of money into that and trying to protect it. But I know that there, there should be, there's other marine protected areas all over Canada, especially in the Arctic and on the East Coast as well. But those are just two I wanted to highlight in the Pacific. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's give uh, Mark a round of applause. Thank you.